Hello and welcome to this service with me, Reverend Stuart Dyer. This is the fourth week in ordinary time, but you don't need me to tell you that there's nothing ordinary about these times, but you're very welcome however and whenever you are joining us. I'm going to begin with some words of scripture. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself and has entrusted us with the message of reconciliation. Amen. And we continue to uh, think about the themes of our service as we draw nearer into God's presence. And I'd like to share some words from Bernadette Farrell's lovely hymn, Everyday God. Earth's creator, everyday God, loving maker, O Jesus, you who shaped us, O Spirit, recreate us, come, be with us. In your presence, every day, God, we are gathered. O Jesus, you have called us, O Spirit, to restore us, come, be with us. Life of all lives, every day, God, love of all loves, O Jesus, hope of all hopes, O Spirit, light of all lights, come, be with us. And a prayer of praise and confession. Let us pray. Generous God, we praise you for the beauty and diversity of your creation, each of us placed here with a purpose each of us called to love and care, each of us welcomed to share in your bountiful goodness. We thank you for each new day and the opportunities we have to worship, to learn and care, and to serve and to witness. Help us to know how to share the good news of Jesus with our families, our friends and our neighbours. We confess that there have been times in the past week when we have not lived up to the challenge of being a disciple. May the assurance of your forgiveness give us the wisdom and strength to know the right words and the right actions to use to reflect your love out into the world for all to see. Amen. And now Sue is going to bring us the reading for today. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to preach, to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently. It came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed, they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Well, I think you'll agree that although the passage today is quite short, it's quite packed, packed with drama and, of course, packed with meaning. Unfortunately, the shortage of time means we only have uh, space here today to unpick a couple of things from the passage. There's plenty more that we could talk about. Uh, Fortunately, Mark will return to some of these themes as we go through his gospel this year. So we'll come back to them and pick them up later. First of all, though, the main message that Mark is getting across is that of the authority of Jesus Christ. He is unusual in his time in being able to speak on his own behalf without reference to other people that's what's intended by Mark's rendering of he spoke with authority, not as the scribes. The scribes were in the habit of teaching with reference to other teachers. Jesus, as we read in other parts of other Gospels, 
spoke from his own heart and mind and with that sense of personal authority. Where does that authority come from? Well, as Christians, we affirm our faith that Jesus is the Son of God. That is the source of his authority, his divine sonship. But of course, it's also worth noting that throughout human history, there hasn't been anybody quite like Jesus Christ. It's impossible to estimate his influence. And it's also true that there is no other individual, no other human being, that people would make claims such as they have about Jesus Christ. So even if you're not a person of faith, the name of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, should still carry a large degree of authority. They're worth investigating, they're worth finding out about because they have been so influential and have been taken to be so authoritative. The second aspect here is of course that of the encounter with the person with the unclean spirit. Now there, this is one of those where we could say lots about it. All I want to say today is that what Jesus does in his ministry essentially is, is crystallised here in his actions towards the man in the synagogue. Jesus sets up or reinforces, I should say, I suppose, reinforces the boundary in the universe and in the human world, in the human uh, experience of the world, the boundary between the darkness and the light. So there's a way of thinking about the healing uh, ministry of Jesus in the same way. It is restoring the health from an unhealthy creation. This is really a very pivotal moment and reveals the purpose of Jesus to set up and restore that barrier. That means that we are free now to walk in the light as Jesus has shown it to us. That God is redeeming the world, not just humankind. And that's expressed in some of Paul's later thoughts about Jesus uh, being all creation waiting for the time of the kingdom of Jesus to come. So Jesus restoring the boundary in individual lives and in a wider sense in the communities around him, stopping the darkness from spreading, protecting us from those things which would lead us into places we, we don't want to go. Now obviously we look at the world around us and we can call that into question. There are plenty of things that have happened in the past 2,000 years where we would say, well, I'm not sure that you protected us from that. Of course, in amongst this, God allows human beings to retain their agency, their independence. They are able to choose whether or not to do this or the other. We each have a moral responsibility for the choices that we make even though we recognise that we're not always free to make some choices, nonetheless, we are the ones with the agency. But it's important to remember that that boundary that Jesus has set up, that uh, movement towards the light, towards the love of God, is hugely influential. I sit here in 21st century uh, Western Europe, very conscious, that even the concept of individual freedom and individual human rights can be traced quite easily, quite explicitly, not so much to the human enlightenment movement, but having its roots in the ministry of the church. That idea that each person is created in God's image is a fundamental building block for some of the other things we take for granted in our society. Yes, those things are often uh, taken away. Yes, those things are often trammeled by human desires. But nonetheless, that boundary has been set and for the majority of people, that movement towards the light has continued. And that is what we're called to. And the simplest way to ensure that that continues is for each of us individually to seek to walk in that light in truth, in love, 
in compassion and forgiveness and to seek justice for all rather than just for some. That is the movement, the markers that Jesus set up in his ministry and which have continued for the past 2,000 years to inspire and lead us into the future. And we pray that they will continue to in the years to come. And may we each play our part in bearing that light and standing up for those things which we know to be right and to lead us forward in that truth. Amen. Well, we're going to do something a bit different now, something a bit new. Uh, as part of an occasional event, we're going to have a little interview with one of the members of one of the churches, just so that we can get to know them and hear a little bit about their lives and catch up with them how they're doing at this moment in time. Uh, so thanks to John Watson for being the first uh, volunteer to share something about his life and his faith and watch out for more uh, interviews coming up soon and if you'd like to be a person asked to take part in that please do let me know but I'll be getting in touch with folk uh, over the next few months and arranging that with you. So let's find out a bit more about John Watson from Redbourne. Well, welcome, John. It's great to have you with us. Uh, thank you for your time. We just w want to ask you a few questions, uh, get to know you a little bit. So perhaps you could start just by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be with us at Redbourne uh, Methodist Church. Uh, yeah, I'm a professional musician, born in the north of England, uh, but came down to London. I've had a link with the Methodist Church since then, well actually before then, because I used to play music with musicians who were in a Methodist Church up north. Um, but I came to live at a place called Chester House, uh, which is a, a, basically a young people's Methodist hostel in uh, North London, uh, in Muswell Hill. And uh, went to the local Methodist church. Uh, I met my wife there. She was a Methodist. Uh, th so that led me down that route. And when we moved to Watford and then to Hemel, we, we looked for local Methodist churches. Um, then my Methodist church, which was Cupid Green, closed down in Hemel Hempstead. And we were looking for a new church. And uh, I'll keep this short now because I could tell you a lot about why we uh, ended up going to Redbourne Church. But we discovered Redbourne uh, Methodist Church, started going there many years ago and have continued. Um, and being a professional musician, it wasn't long before uh, somebody discovered. And there I was playing on Sunday morning and doing various other things. Um, oh. And as it is at the moment, I am the main there are a couple of other um, pianists in the in the church, but I'm the main musician at the church and, and obviously now providing music for online services as well. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. That's great. I mean, I think we might have to have another conversation another day about uh, the role of music in Methodism. You know, it's, it's a movement born in song, as they say, which I'm sure is something you're very well aware of. But I wonder uh, for now, um, we do hear a lot on the news about uh, how the restrictions are affecting people in, in the music business and in uh, theatre and, and the arts generally. Perhaps you could just say a little bit about to help us understand and you know, in, uh, get to know you and, and help you in our prayers, etc. How has it affected you as a musician going through the restrictions uh, personally? Um, it's been bittersweet. Uh, the bitter side was that I literally got a few days notice last March. Um, uh, I'm the resident pianist at the Langham uh, London, which is a hotel uh, opposite the BBC at the top of Regent Street. Fantastic hotel. Uh, and I provide the music there seven days a week. So I would go in four or five afternoons, maybe. Uh, if they wanted jazz, I would have a jazz trio or jazz queue in the evening as well. That just all came to an end. Um, and within the week, all my private bookings, because I do a lot of private parties, especially in North London, um, one by one, they all found up and cancelled. Some uh, rescheduled, some are having to reschedule again. 
and some got so low about it that they don't really want to have a party anymore. Um, so as I said, it all came to an end. Um, so from March, middle of March 2020 to now, I've literally had six weeks playing, uh, professional playing, because I went back to the Langham in October, then we were in lockdown in November, went back in December, I was booked for every day of uh, December, and of course that's um, stopped in the middle of December. So that's been that. So that's the bitter side of it. Um, the, the sweet side of it is that um, I'm very blessed that we are okay uh, um, as a family and also um, it opened up lots of creative opportunities for me. I already have a record label and uh, since March 2020 I've been able to bring out, release three EPs of all original material um, on, on my record but you can get them on Spotify, Apple Music etc etc I just wouldn't have had the time and the energy to do that and it was something that I put on the back burner um, I've also done some live stream performances I did a, uh, there was a Kai Cancer Care Centre which I used to go and do little performances for um, to raise spirits and what have you and so they started doing um, live stream and, and interviews, interviews with people like, um, uh, oh, I don't know, Matt Lucas, uh, Don Black, uh, Esther Ranson, and me. And uh, so that was good. And a couple of live stream shows uh, with Lee John of Imagination, uh, who's the artist and man that I work with. Um, so we did some kind of acoustic. Um, in fact, there's one which is again going to be, um, might as well plug, uh, is again going to be uh, shown um, on the internet on 29th of, of January in a few days' time. So that was good. So people were still seeing me. Um, and then, of course, I uh, designed the website for Redbourne Methodist Church back in 2007, really needed updating. So again, with the new skills that I'd gained from updating my personal website, I was able to uh, do a new website for the church. It all takes time, um, and I wouldn't have had the time otherwise, and I, I'm quite pleased with the results. Uh, that has led, because we keep going back in, into lockdown and can't have um, live services, we've done more and, online services, um, uh, church services, which meant, I thought, well, you know, people really love singing. And as you mentioned, Stuart, it's such an important part of the Methodist church and we can't sing together. So why don't I do some lyrics videos of uh, me singing uh, and doing my arrangements of, of um, famous hymns so that people can sit at home and they can sing along or just at least read the words and enjoy the music. You know, so there's lots of things that have been good for me that come out of it, but I'm very humbly aware that lockdown has been so different for different people. Um, and I'm just glad that I've had the privilege of being able to do all these different things. How has your faith helped you uh, through those difficult transitions? I mean, has it helped you or, or has it been something else? But it, if you could just say a few words about how uh, you, your faith has has buoyed you up perhaps or given you a different perspective my christianity has helped me deal with the negative side of things and and basically the important thing i always remember every morning is that my life is in his hands right and that um you know you can fight and fight and obviously you want to be proactive doing things but at the end of the day your life is in his hands, it's his power, it's his grace that gets you through. Um, so I suppose in a reciprocal way, that's what has made me want to do more and more for the church, especially when I have the, the time and the skills that I've, I've built up over these years that I can channel into that. I, th I think that's the best way I can answer your question. And of course, plus is like, you know, I've, my dog's had longer walks and I've seen the family more often, you know, um, that's been a positive side. But I'm aware, again, I'm aware that everyone's lockdown has been different. 
And that's how I've been able to use I my... have been able to come out as a Christian. And because more and more things that I'm doing are um, to do with the church, to do with my faith, uh, even EPs, you know, people look at Spotify and they, they find my and they find my jazz albums and everything. But now there's a a Christmas EP, and you know it's it's quite um, quite exhilarating to feel that you, you you don't have to be forced into a situation and say, look, this is me, this is the real me. You know that there are other parts of me, but this is the real me you're seeing, and I'm not afraid to show it. It's just lovely to hear that it's coming out of a place of deep gratitude and, uh, you know, just uh, response, really, isn't it? Rather than a, you know, yeah, have that's to. Great. That's really good. Well, John, it'd be great to, to uh, get in touch with you a, another time and hear how that's gone. Maybe when things have changed and sort of uh, touch base again, I, I think we could have many conversations around music and and church and the arts uh, it's wonderful to hear that sense of yeah freedom coming out that uh, you you uh, you articulated so so well so thank you so much uh, thank you for your time uh, and i know what we've shared today is going to be helpful to lots of people and i hope we're all encouraged to uh, wear our faith a little bit more boldly in these times uh, and you've certainly helped us to do that so uh, Thank you, John, and we look forward to hearing more of your music and uh, and your thoughts as we go through this year together. Thanks. Well, of course, for Christians, a large part of maintaining the boundary that I was talking about earlier of the difference between dark and light and making sure that we are living in God's light and love is for Christians uh, part of our daily prayer, part of our intercession, part of our communing with God and presenting our requests to him, knowing that he hears us and works mysteriously, often through answering the prayers of his people. So we take a time now to come and lift to God our concerns for the world and for others. We pray for the world, loving God, and ask that by your Spirit we may learn how to better care for and share its riches so that all people and all of nature can truly flourish. We remember, loving, compassionate one, at this time all health workers, all those working in the NHS in whatever way, so many of them overwrought, so many of them close to breaking point, so many in need of rest and recuperation. We pray they may find your peace and we pray for the days and weeks and months ahead that they may find that rest, that they may have time and opportunity to regroup and find the help they need to come back and face the demands of their already difficult job in the days and months to come. We thank you, O oh God, for them and with them all carers and everyone providing vital goods and services that we all depend upon. Lifting them to you, we pray then for our leaders that they would have wisdom that they would have a sense of rightness and light, that they may care for lives and livelihoods in such a way that everyone is valued in our society for who they are. At this time, I especially invite you to pray for whoever or whichever group of people is laid on your heart. Loving God, we have heard of from your word that you sent your son to set up and reinforce the boundary between dark and light. You sent your son to redeem, to bring us back into the life that you offer us. 
May we in the church have the boldness to speak and act for peace and justice. May we begin in our congregations. May we begin in our structures and in our traditions. And may we also shed that light around the communities that we seek to serve in every way. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our friend. Amen. And just before we take our parting, I'm going to uh, share with you a prayer from Martin Luther. As we look to the days ahead, O oh God, let us know your power to make us strong, your counsel to make us wise, your grace to make us holy, and your glory to bring us into your presence. Amen. It's been great to have you with me. I hope you'll be able to join us again soon. Uh, and until we see you then uh, in person or virtually, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all you love now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.